Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host, Alexa Von Tobel. And this week, I'm excited for you to meet Andrew Dunham, co-founder and CEO of Hims and Hers, the leading health and wellness platform on a mission to help the world feel great through the power of better health. Andrew launched Hims in 2017 to provide modern, personalized health and wellness experiences. Since then, Andrew has overseen the company's growth to become a leading consumer health platform, powering nearly 9 million medical visits and enabling access for millions of people for a broad range of care, including those related to mental health, sexual health, dermatology, and primary care. Under Andrew's leadership, Hims debuted on the New York Stock Exchange in 2021, where he continues to lead the company as CEO and chairman. A graduate of Wharton, Andrew has intertwined his passion for innovation and disruption into the culture and DNA of Hims and Hers. Andrew is an active advisor and philanthropist focused on community, charitable, and philanthropic causes. He is a native San Franciscan where he resides with his wife and children. And with that, let's welcome Andrew. First of all, Andrew, I'm thrilled to have you on. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to 2017. What was the aha moment and how did you stand up the company out of Atomic, your startup studio? Thanks for having me, Alexa. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. The aha moment with him was really interesting, which was as an individual, as a consumer, I really wanted this business to exist, right? I think maybe most men want this business to exist, right? We, we avoid going to the doctors at almost all costs. You know, I think one person told me back then, they only like going to the doctors if they literally have a broken bone, then they'll go. And so there's the shame and stigma and like machoism associated with men that prevented them from getting care. I think on the business side of the house, it was really interesting just as a founder, having built a lot of companies at Atomic over that that five, 10 year period, that when I looked at healthcare, it was the largest industry in the country that had yet to be touched by modern technology. You know, you're talking about a $4 trillion industry. It was this really paternalistic system where you had to go to the brick and mortar. They would take a look at you, and then they would tell you what you're going to get, and you had to pay whatever it was, and that was it. And that just felt entirely broken. And so there was this really big moment where we looked around and said, modern technology, building healthcare system from the ground up is necessary. That's entirely customer-oriented, customer-first, customer preferences and choice and transparency, and build it in a way that's going to make them feel great and be something that they love. And that's where the brand part of this really comes in. It's a healthcare system that we built from scratch, but it's also a consumer brand that people know and love and respect. And the combination of the two to us was really the most powerful thing to bring to market. Can we go back to the sort of beginning? Because you built Hims and Hers pre-pandemic, mm-hmm. early to telehealth, the First week you were up, you did a staggering 1 million in sales. Talk through a little bit of like what the first offering was and what that looked like for you living through it. Yeah. I remember the night before we launched the company, there was like a seven person team at that point. And we went to a restaurant and it was like 1 a.m. It was a bar. It was 1 a.m. And I said, listen, tomorrow we're going to launch. And if at some point over the next year, we can get to a hundred signups a day, we will have built a huge company. And everyone, you know, looked at me and said, oh my God, I don't think we're ever going to be able to do that. We launched the next day. We got 500 signups a day within the first week. Wow. And everything broke. I'm talking about everything. We had one or two doctors. We had one customer support service person. I got a phone call from my co-founders at 7 a.m. saying that our pharmacy partner had decided that they didn't think they could fulfill our business that morning, the morning of launch as orders were sitting there waiting to be filled. So, you know, it it was this, this moment of incredible energy because you're like, you figured it out. You found something that people want. And I think we spent a lot of time and I give a lot of credit to the team early, to the investors early, Josh Kushner, Kirsten Green, these people helped me a tremendous amount in really thinking about who is the person you're trying to solve for and what is the pain that they are really going through? And then how do you make sure what you bring to market just addresses that head on? I want to go and talk a little bit about knowing you have product market fit. Let's walk through the evolution of HIMS when you launch HERS, what the product offering started, how it evolved. Just give people a sense of like what 
the North Star was as you were developing the product experience? Yeah. So the, the North Star was to deliver on-demand great healthcare from the comfort of your phone. When we first launched, it was men's dermatology, men's hair loss, men's sexual dysfunction issues, STDs, you know, things that for the most part, people are kind of sensitive to talk about. They're not super excited to go share in person, but also affect a huge portion of the population. And so for those men, they could go from their phone to hymns.com. They could connect with a provider who is licensed in their state within minutes, who is a specialist in the category or condition they're concerned with, and then get diagnosed, treated, have a medical consultation, and then get a prescription that was personalized to them, delivered to their door for like 30 bucks. That was the core. Can you deliver all of that value, the medical consultation, the diagnosis, and the treatment, and the delivery to your door from the comfort of your couch when you're using your phone for something like $30? And if you can do that, you have really disrupted the traditional healthcare system. And so we started with HIMSS in 2017. On the one-year anniversary of the company, we launched HERS, which included as well things like dermatology, hair care, birth control, which is a huge assortment of products and services. So last week, we launched a whole new weight loss category, which we are incredibly excited about. I mean, thousands of people have signed up already just in the first few days. The month or two before that, we launched an entire heart health category, which helps people with preventative cardiovascular care. So men who are at risk of heart attack can have a preventative heart attack medication built into their other medications. So it's one simple pill, but also taking care of the heart attack risk and keeping it all at a 30 to $40 price point is really the goal as well. You have this quote that I want to dig into. Um, having built now one of the biggest consumer healthcare brands out there, you have this quote, which is that it's never been easier to build a company, but it's never been harder to build a brand. What do you mean by that? You know, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a good one. You know, I think when you look in the last 10, 15 years, the tools and services to bring something to market have expanded dramatically. I mean, you could launch a Squarespace website today. You could put Facebook ads on it tomorrow. And all of a sudden you've got a business. The problem is that with this huge explosion of front door businesses and consumer demand and interest, there's not a lot of depth that's created in the relationship with the customer. And so what I mean by that is in order to build a brand that people love and trust and respect, you have to do much more than what is now very simple. And so things that we think about a lot, you know, how do you invent and innovate on behalf of our customers? So we're launching products and services that are in many situations, the first time these medications have been compounded or personalized allowing patients to get really unique treatments. How do you optimize the experience on their behalf? How do you make it faster and more seamless and quicker? How do you take margin? We've been talking about this in the last couple of quarters with Wall Street. You know, As the business gets more scale, we're getting more efficient, and then we're taking that margin and we're putting it right back into the customer's pocket, making it more affordable, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And then how are you super transparent, right? Whether it's pricing or options or choice that they have. These are the things that are actually hard to do, hard to build, but they are things that I think over time underpin trust and build the reputation and respect for the brand. And so you can put websites up today. You can have Facebook ads going to it tomorrow. Instagram makes that incredibly easy. You see sweatshirt companies popping up left and right, but building a brand that people know and love and respect and rely on is really challenging. And I think that's where we spend a lot of time, which is under the hood, building the elements and foundation of trust. I love it. And I love something you just said there, which is often we think of brand as like the front, you know, the colors and the logo. Yeah. Brand is every time you interact with my business. That's right. Brand is the definition of a brand is a repeatable experience, right? Brand is how you feel when you're engaging with the company. It's not the logo. It's not the colors only, right? Which is like very much how you think about brand as you get started. Andrew, one of the things that is pretty unique, you notably do not accept insurance. Instead, pricing products and services so that they're just accessible for consumers. How do you see your relationship with insurers evolving over time? The answer to that question is rooted in what you're talking about, which is an understanding of the customer and the brand. And what we aim to do is deliver world-class care, world-class products, personalized care that people love at very affordable prices seamlessly. 
And what we have found is that by rebuilding each part of these systems, we've rebuilt our doctor networks, we've rebuilt our own pharmacies that we operate, we've rebuilt whole technology platforms that the doctors and patients utilize. So with a built from scratch healthcare system, you can actually rip out a ton of cost, a ton of cost through every single part of the supply chain. And by doing that, we're delivering prices, like I said, at 30 to 40 bucks. Well, it turns out most of the country is on a high deductible insurance plan. And what that means is that customers of ours need to pay upwards of two to $3,000 a year in cash before they even get the benefit of insurance. And most people actually can't even afford to pay that copay and that deductible. And so what we found is while most of the country is insured, most of the country is not benefiting from insurance because of that high deductible. And so if we can offer something for $30 or $40, which includes not only the doctor visit, not only the medicine, not only the ongoing treatment and care with that provider and adjustments to the medicine, but also getting it delivered to your door, you've beaten the insurance system. It's not only more streamlined and easy, but it's actually cheaper, right? Because most people, for example, weight loss, great example, people will have to pay $100 copays to see a weight loss specialist, you know? And if you want to go see a dermatologist, that's a $75 copay. And if you want to see a psychiatrist, that could be a $150 copay and it could be six or seven weeks. Right. And so being able to deliver all of that value for less than the individual copay, I think is really disruptive and turns the need for insurance entirely on its head. So we have not had a need for it. And our customers, I think, have not demanded it because our customers are getting more affordable prices with the Hims and Hers platform as it is today. You said you're branching into things like weight loss and weight care. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what you're excited about? Where are you taking the business? We are moving very fast. The team is on like top gear. There are so many categories that overlap with barriers to access, stigma, lack of education. It's just too damn expensive. And there's a lot of people suffering. And there's a lot of those categories, weight loss, mental health. We shared that our mental health business, which we launched during COVID, kind of rapidly in time of customer demand, just given that time in in the country, that business is 125,000 subs growing triple digits. We launched the heart health category that's 100 million people in the country at risk of heart attack, and it's the number one cause of death for men worldwide, right? And being able to deliver these services from the comfort of your home, but also in enjoyable ways. So for example, with heart health, you're taking your, let's say, daily treatment for hair loss, and as part of that, your heart medication is built into the pill, right? Into the custom pill, so that you remember to take your heart medication. Or with weight loss, When you open up your package, which launched this week, and you start your treatments, which often include medications to suppress appetite, depressive eating, binge eating, insulin resistance, things of this sort that drive weight gain, the experience is beautiful. The medicine smells great. I mean, these little things like you talked about, Alexa, like where the experience and every touch point makes you feel like you're taking a great step forward in your health. Those are the things we focus on, but there are so many categories from mental health to weight loss that we believe, you know, affect almost every household in the country. Almost nobody is getting treated and the barriers are so high that in the next five to 10 years, this company can absolutely transform the landscape for wellness and health. And that's really what we're most excited by. In 2021, you took the company public, your CEO and executive chairman, you did it in the middle of the pandemic. Just tell us what that was like. It was entirely surreal. I mean, across so many dimensions, we took the company public after three years of founding the company, right? Three years of launching the company. Which is crazy for everybody out there that is not normal to build a company and take it public a handful of years. But it was really special because it was such a moment of celebration for all of the people who believed in this mission from the beginning. It was my, my grandfather's, I think, 91st birthday, the day we went public. And my grandfather came from an immigrant family and ran a laundrette dry cleaner in Oakland, California. And I just remember how powerful that felt to be able to have also such generational change with regard to opportunity and with regard to kind of impact. And and I was just so thankful in a lot of ways for all of the family and the history that put me in a position, the schooling, the education that allowed me to do this. I remember feeling like it was the beginning. I, I was, I think, 32 at the time when we went public. And I felt like this is the beginning of a 20 or 30 year journey. 
because this business, if we do it right, is a business that every household in the country should and, and can rely on. And I don't think there's anybody doing it better than us. I love that. Before we transition to just more about you, one last thing on the prediction where the world is headed. Yeah. You sit at the helm now of one of the fastest growing companies in healthcare. As we fast forward five years, uh, 10 years, give us a prediction or two that's just really obvious to you, given your experience that maybe isn't obvious to everyone else. Yeah, I think there's a few. You know, I think the first is this concept of telemedicine being different from medicine. The overwhelming love and demand for healthcare that is accessible from your phone, from the comfort of your home is unparalleled. It is more affordable, it's more streamlined, it's more beautiful, you have more access, it's just better, I believe. And so I think in the next five to 10 years, more and more people are gonna see that. The word telemedicine is gonna frankly just disappear. And what we are talking about today will just be healthcare. So I'm excited for that transformation to continue to take shape. I think there's two others. First, personalization. It is so clear to me running this company that customers want selection and they want customized experiences and treatments for their specific situation. Gone are the days of walking into a doctor's office saying you have some issue and the doctor saying, bam, here's the medicine. Don't think twice about it. Don't research it. Don't look it up. Don't ask for anything else. Just take it. People are informed and they have choice and they have access to the internet to explore and they want things that are going to work specifically for them. If you go to LA and if you go to New York, there are people who have access to incredible personalized custom care and they're paying a tremendous amount of money for it. And bringing that personalization to the masses is so obvious to me. The second is just technology enabled care, better technology that makes you feel better faster. We launched something a couple months ago called MedMatch. It's an ML model that actually looks at all of our psychiatric data. We've had hundreds of thousands of visits. We've treated hundreds of thousands of patients to identify for you as a specific person suffering from this type of depression, this medicine and this dose is most likely to get you to remission the fastest. And we built that technology, we built it into our platform so our providers can now see that, see that information, understand that recommendation and include that insight in their diagnosis and in their treatment behavior. It's resulting in happier customers, people switching medicines less often, less side effects, and people actually getting to remission quicker. So leveraging this massive amount of technology and data that exists to treat patients better and in a more informed way so that your experience is not only dependent on the experience of the one doctor you're talking to, but the collective experience of maybe hundreds of thousands of doctors, that I think is an obvious thing to me that's just going to completely disrupt the care model and frankly, make people healthier much, much faster. I love you talking about just the power of the consumer today. They have so much information. And I think the respect you pay your customer is very clear in how you think about strategy. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. I want to transition to you. You know, you've started to tell us a little bit about who you are, but you grew up in San Francisco. And I always like to ask the question was, in the rearview mirror, now that you have children yourself, was there something that your parents did that helped you become a better entrepreneur or a better founder or that set you up to be successful yeah. in an uncharted environment? My mother... I wanted to be, when I was four years old, a rock star. So I wanted to like have an electric guitar and be a rock star. And she somehow convinced me that the path to being a great electric guitar player in a rock band was to learn cello. And I don't know how she convinced me of this, but I was four and I believed her. And it was quite brilliant of her. So for 20 years, I was a concert cellist. I played Carnegie Hall. I toured Europe uh, multiple times. I played hundreds of weddings across the, the country. And the diligence required and the specialization required to become good at something like cello over 20 years was an incredible learning. I mean, just the consistency, the thousands and thousands of hours, the practice, the regimen, and she held me accountable every single day. And I think back on that today because my willingness to endure things that I often don't enjoy doing but know are important is very high. 
my ability to stay focused on something that I think is critical for the long-term success of the business, despite the fact that it's difficult or painful or frustrating or pissing people off is very, very high. And I think that grit and commitment and ability to focus and become excellent at a thing has served me very, very well in running this company. I love that. By the way, I just need to call out the fact that you are a wildly talented cellist on top of everything else is pretty cool. I want to hear what the other big lesson was. Yeah, dad was a little bit different. So my father was a lawyer and a musician and had a personality of like a founder and warrior, right? Like took no crap from nobody, asked the question why always, took nothing on face value, wanted to figure it out himself. I remember hearing stories about my grandfather, his father, who also was a businessman and and built his own company from scratch as an immigrant. His desire to break out of family traditions as a kid and the family business as a teenager to build his own business and how upset the family was that he did that. And so there was just the spirit of almost rebellion that was in my DNA from that side of the family in the pursuit of greatness, in the pursuit of doing what you wanted to do and what spoke to you. I love that so much. And actually, there's something pretty beautiful in the natural comfort with standing out. Tell us more about how you think about building that comfort. As I got older, as I met founders and I built this company and, and other companies, I you know realized that old saying, which is nobody truly knows what they're doing at, at the end of the day. Everyone is truly just doing their best. And you learn that. I don't know what you're talking about. I I know most about what I'm right. doing. I always joke as a parent. I'm like, we literally are making this up as we go. Everybody is making everything up all the way up to the president. And it's just the reality. And when you deeply understand that and you actually deeply see that, it is wildly comforting and it is wildly confidence inducing. You know, because you see people who say, well, if that person's making it up, well, I can make it up too. Like if that person is just trusting their instinct and if that person is using the resources they have and going off their gut, well, I have a gut and mine is just as valuable. And so I think as I got older, I learned that and I, and I appreciated that. And I think that gave me comfort to be my own personality and take risks. I think the other thing for me, I always, I think this was just a part of my personality as a young age. I never wanted to compete with anybody. I never wanted to be able to be compared to anybody. And I think it was because internally, I was always so focused on what I wanted to build and what I wanted to do and how excited I was by that, that often place it was nothing like what anybody else was doing, but it didn't matter, right? For me, it was competing with myself. It is exclusively that I believe I can build something much more impactful than we are today. And I believe that's something that every household in the country can experience and can experience through my team and our focus and our hard work. And that's the only thing that keeps me going. And so it's a total internal competition at the end of the day that I think is at the core of what makes me click. I think I have a similar wiring to that, which it really is like a love of the problem solving. And it it's sort of a love of the, the complexity, oh. right? Like it, you got to love the, I, I love the build. So I so appreciate that, Andrew. And actually that's a really great thing to also teach children. So I, I love everything. There's so many gems in what you just said. Okay. I want to now transition. Building a company is stressful. Let's be honest. Like there are days where Somebody once said to me, Andrew, I was probably a few years into building LearnVest, and they were like, if you knew what it takes to build a company, you would never start. Yeah. Because there's just moments where you're like, I'm so tired. I couldn't possibly be more tired, but we've got to go to a different level because something else just got worse. How do you manage the stress? What have you learned that you can pay for to others? Yeah. Well, it's definitely a constant evolution of learning. I have yet to figure it out is maybe the short answer, but I have actively experimenting because I think you have to as a founder, because as you said, it, it can be entirely encompassing and very detrimental to your health and to your sleep. And so really appreciating that 
if you're going to build something in value, you're not going to build it that night, right? Like you're not like you staying up until 4am to bust out something like it actually is not going to matter in the success of your business. Building companies is a marathon and it's a very, very long marathon. It's like a ultra marathon. There's no part about this business that's a sprint, like truly. And so I think a lot of young entrepreneurs burn themselves out pretty quickly because they don't realize that they think this hacker mentality, the all night mentality is like how you get there. And, and yeah, maybe in the early days, there's a couple of those nights where you have to do that and it can be energizing and fun. But when you're building something for a long time, making sure you're investing in the right things in the right order with the right people, that's what matters. And those things don't happen at 4 a.m. Those happen with clear thought and planning and organization and a willingness to keep working hard for a very long period of time and let all that value compound over many, many years. And so I think when you actually like shed the necessity to have that sprint mentality, you can actually enjoy life. Go get dinner with your partner. Stop working at 4.30 and go pick up your kids. It is not going to make the difference between your company. And anybody who tells you it will, I don't believe has actually built and run a successful company. Because doing this for a long period of time requires understanding that in marathons, you need water and you need to slow down sometimes. And then sometimes you speed up and you have to switch modes. But that single mode is not scalable and is not going to set you up for health, wellness, or success with the business. I love that a lot. And it's spoken like somebody who's running a long marathon. Andrew, I want to transition. I'm going to ask you a question. I just want the first thing that comes to your mind. What gets you up every day? My kids. What is an interview question that you'd love to ask people to better understand who they are and what drives them? What's the thing they're the best at in the world? If you have to think of the biggest pinch me moment to date at Hims, what is it? Probably last quarter when we shared that the company was tracking to nearly a billion in revenue run rate and profitable in the next quarter or two, net income profitable. That was just like really, that took me back. Cool. That's amazing. What is a book that's had a major impact on your life of any kind? Creativity Inc. It's a book about the way in which Pixar consistently delivers great stories and creativity and the structure and processes that they put in place to empower their team to deliver that. I love that. Is there a quote or a mantra that is like a running on the back tape of your head? Is there a quote that means a lot to you? Yeah. Keep it stupid simple, which is from my dad. Just when everything's crazy and you're trying to figure out what to do, just keep it simple. I like it. If you have to think about a category of innovation that you're most excited about and it can't be AI, what is it? Probably this transformation to personalized care. Like people understanding their body, their genetics, their predispositions, and getting treated in a way preventatively in an empowered way that that could just massively extend the lifespan of humanity, could massively reduce the unnecessary deaths by some of the most common things like heart attacks and obesity. The treatments are there. The access and technology and means of people getting it is not, but that I think is going to be wildly important. Last question. As a founder, what do you hold as sacred? What's something that is the word sacred? My team, probably. My management team, my direct reports, taking care of them, making sure it's the right people, making sure that they're engaging with each other in the right ways. That I think is really, that's really sacred. Andrew, this has been such a pleasure. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody out there, if you want to check out Hims, please head to hims.com. Check out hers. Andrew, what an absolute, just incredible leader you are. This has been so much fun. I feel like I picked up personal advice, life advice, parenting advice. And you can join us, everybody, next week for Inc. The Founders Project with Alex Von Tobel. Andrew, we're rooting for you. What you've done in such a short period of time is truly the word remarkable is the right word. It's remarkable. And I have a feeling you're just getting started, which is even cooler. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.